Thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Devin DiParlo. I'm our senior sales manager at SoFar. Uh, I'm based on the East Coast in Boston, and I'm excited to chat with you a little bit more today, along with some of our customers, about collecting ocean data at scale with the spotter and smart mooring. Um, I am joined today by three of our awesome customers, Omar Reynoso from Adamar, Katie Lesneski from NOAA and Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuaries, and then Chris LeClaire from University of North Carolina at Wilmington. Um, I'll let each of them introduce themselves before their presentation in more detail, but uh, all three of, uh, you know, Omar, Katie, and Chris are customers of SOFAR who utilize spotters and smart moorings to collect ocean data at scale and small networks of sort of heterogeneous sensors. But quickly, before we get going, just to, as a reminder, sort of give some background on SOFAR, we are an ocean intelligence and sensing company headquartered in San Francisco, California. We're a team of about 85 engineers, ocean scientists, and business professionals that are on a mission to connect the world's oceans to power a more sustainable future. And really the reason we exist as a company is that there's a massive data gap that exists in marine environments because sensors just aren't designed for scale, especially when trying to collect real-time data. Um, and as Walter Monk once said, you know, the first hundred years of oceanography could well be called a century of undersampling. And we're fundamentally changing that with our spotter and smart mooring systems that unlock ocean data collection for sort of a fraction of the cost while also breaking down the barriers of complexity that um, generally prohibit scalability as well. Um, and ultimately, the, the solutions that we're going to be talking about today sort of tie into the evolution of um, marine data collection from really large, expensive systems like you see all the way on the left that are collecting you know, oceanographic and meteorological data, all the way down to the spotter on the right, which is migrating more towards lower cost, hyperscalable, easy to use systems um, and having many nodes versus just one individual node um, to rely on data collection. So from here, we'll kick it off into our first presentation. And so Katie, I will pass it off to you to talk a little bit about your experience with spotters and smart moorings at um, Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Great, thank you so much. And thanks for hosting this webinar today. Uh, my name is Katie. I am a research and monitoring coordinator at the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, uh, specifically for reef restoration related to a project that I'll talk more about called Mission Iconic Reefs. And my background is understanding the ecology, physiology, and genetics of corals to inform the science needed to undertake coral restoration. So just to set the stage um, to understand kind of the rest of my talk, um, I really want to place into context how valuable Florida's coral reefs are. Um, these values extend to other reefs throughout the world as well, but here in Florida alone, on an annual basis, coral reefs provide over $350 million in flood protection and billions of dollars from local sales, tourism, and local income. Um, in addition to the economic valuation, we also think about uh, ecological values. Um, and the Florida Keys Reef is the third largest living barrier reef system, extending over 350 miles, supporting dozens of coral species and hundreds of fish species, as well as uh, several other really important ecosystems. Um, so despite their importance, unfortunately, over several decades, the reefs here have degraded, which is a trend that we are seeing at other reefs throughout the world. So this series of pictures here shows one of the reefs that we're actually restoring now, and it's clear degradation in terms of structure over about four decades. So some of the contributing factors to this degradation include hurricanes, bleaching events, which we're just um, hopefully coming to the end of here, poor water quality that's often driven by coastal development, overfishing, loss of herbivores and disease, um, and of course the effects of, of global climate change, which has led to population and these structural declines. So this degradation has led folks here to really realize that we need to implement a multi-decade holistic coral reef restoration approach, which is called uh, Mission Iconic Reefs. And this is an effort to restore seven of Florida's what, we're call, what we call historically iconic reefs that extend all the way from Key Largo down to off the coast of Key West. And these reefs here are our current targets. So the uh, success of these restoration activities, such as growing coral um, in a protected area offshore or returning coral, as you can see in this photo here to the reefs, 
The success of those activities is really related to environmental conditions, including seasonal warm waters and marine heat waves like the one that we have documented here this summer that has caused what you see in this photo um, is coral bleaching. And I can talk more about coral bleaching later, um, but if a coral undergoes bleaching, it is actually losing one of its main food sources. And if conditions don't improve, the coral can essentially starve to death. So we really need to, need to have a good understanding of current environmental conditions when we make decisions about undertaking any of these activities on a day-to-day -day basis. So we really need to un understand temperature trends at scale. And this image here is um, pinpoints indicating locations of currently active as well as inactive in the red temperature meters that are deployed on the reef floor. Um, as you can imagine, these are all benthic sensors, so we have to physically go out, retrieve them, download the data, and then redeploy. And many of these are red because they've either been lost or funding has been lost for these projects, and so they're no longer actively collecting data. Uh, these dots here indicate our currently deployed benthic temperature sensors at each of our seven target uh, reef restoration sites. And at any given site, we have uh, deployed these across several locations. So attempting to get a cross section of the reef from shallow to deep, and then spread out um, throughout the rest of the reef as well. And again, these are recording um, bottom temperature. Um, unfortunately, other live data products that we have access to, such as this snapshot here that comes from NOAA's Coral Reef Watch, those only give us um, one value per day and are only surface values. And we know that there can be temperature differences between the surface and down on the reef. Uh, you can hit next. And even currently existing buoys like the one here in Key West from the National Buoy Data Center, uh, those again only record surface values. So it could be the case that the water temperatures below are a bit cooler. Um, and so the geographic span of this monitoring network and our need for synchronicity is really, really big. It's over 120 miles if you were to drive from the Northern Reef to the Southern Reef. So what are we to do? Um, we found that SOPAR spotters provide a really easy, cost-effective and quality solution where we are able to obtain live data from both um, one meter below the surface and then right above the benthic areas right above the reef bottom so that we have this dual view of temperature differentials both at the surface and the bottom. Um, and the great thing is that of course spotters provide a highly customized solution for each site. So this is an aerial view of one of our shallow reef areas and by looking at where other temperature sensors already were in place we could determine um, that if you hit next that this little patch area with sand uh, at 11 feet deep was a great location to deploy one of these spotters right here in the middle of the reef. Um, so spotters will also help us assist in field operations planning. So many of our sites are quite far from where we deploy boats. This one here is almost 17 miles. Um, and so sometimes uh, we'll actually get out there and we'll find that the wave conditions are um, unsafe for our operations, but if we were to deploy a spotter here before we even get on the boat and go for this hour long ride, we would be able to determine if it were, was worth the haul out there or not. Um, additionally, we have purchased one of the bristle mouth development units um, and we plan to couple this with a turbidity sensor um, again to help us decide whether or not the long trek out to the reef is worth it for certain types of data that, that data that we collect. Um, so what you're seeing here on the right is what we call an ortho mosaic or a collage of photos that recreates um, the structure of the reef as well as the colors. And we need very, very crystal clear calm water to do this. And I myself have gone out many times and found conditions were just not worth it to collect this data. Um, so we hope that addition of these units will help us in the future along those lines. Um, and then, of course, uh, we're thinking about, okay, when is a good time to actually return corals onto the reef? Um, as many of you probably know, we've had a marine heat wave and a bleaching event this year. And once the temperature reaches a certain threshold, we typically cease all activities related to coral restoration until the waters cool back down. So on a site-to-site -site basis, again, across those 120 miles, we can determine each day whether the temperature um, is on a downward trend or an upward trend um, in helping us to figure out if we should delay those restoration activities. Um, and this is an example of something that we have reconstructed from one of those deployed benthic loggers where we're seeing again um, 
the days in this summer when the temperature at this site was over what we call that bleaching threshold or that temperature when it is actually um, not the best idea to conduct coral restoration activities. So we can get this much more easily, the same information from these SOFAR buoys. Uh, we are also really excited that the, the data from these buoys will be used to improve sea surface temperature models for other groups. Um, so this is a snapshot of an experimental product from Coral Reef Watch where there are sea surface temperature daily values for five kilometer pixel areas. And the idea is that um, we can have a better understanding of what's going on at the surface and the subsurface by coupling this data here with the live daily match data from the SOFAR buoys. Um, and of course, all these data will benefit public and private partners. And Mission Iconic Reefs is an absolutely massive initiative spanning state, federal, uh, nonprofit, and academic partners. So all of the organizations you see here and more will be able to have free access to the data that's on the Aqualink network to help them plan their operations as well. Thanks so much, Katie. So without further ado, I'll pass it off to Chris LeClaire from University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Chris, over to you. Sure. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, my name is Chris LeClaire. I'm with the Coastal Ocean Research and Monitoring Program at the North Car Un University of North Carolina at Wilmington. Um, I'm a, I've been with CORMP for 11 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in the United States Coast Guard. Um, I really enjoy working with researchers to deploy instruments and sensors in remote locations and uh, coming up with unique solutions to collect their desired data. Um, our lead PI, Lynn Leonard, is uh, unable to be here, so she's usually the one who would be doing presentations and stuff, so you guys are stuck with me. So CORP was established in 1999 as a sub-regional component of the Southeastern Ocean Observing Regional Association. And uh, so CORP's main funding comes from NOAA's IU's office through Socorro. And our main goals are to provide hourly observations of oceanographic conditions and marine weather, equip stakeholders to face natural and man-made risks, and conduct basic and applied research to ensure a safe, productive, and resilient ocean and coastal zone. Um, CORP is one of the longest continuously funded research programs at UNCW. Um, over time, we've developed many partnerships in the ocean observing space. Um, we've got some logos down below. We work closely with the National Weather Service offices local to Wilmington and Charleston, um, the Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Marine Corps base at Camp Lejeune, and the Coastal Data Information Program at Scripps. So CORP, <laughs> CORP currently maintains or assists in the maintenance of 20 near real-time platforms as one as well as one non-real-time bottom-mounted instrument frame. Uh, the real-time array consists of uh, seven met ocean buoy sites, so collecting the standard meteorological parameters, as well as surface water temperature and salinity. We have uh, nine wave buoys in our region. Uh, three of those are um, CDIP data well wave riders, one of which CORMP owns directly. Um, and the other six are so far wave spotters. And that doesn't include the, I guess, currently unmoored NOPP buoy. Um, we have three land-based weather stations. Two of those are on Masonboro Island, which is a eight mile long uh, barrier island, kind of between Riceville Beach and Carolina Beach on the, uh, right off on the coast of Wilmington there. And we have another one at the Center for Marine Science dock, as well as a surveyed water level station and a, one uh, real-time water quality sond. Let's see. So all of this data is published in real time and QAQC'd in real time as well. It's uh, sent via ERDAP to NDBC, and we utilize both cellular and iridium telemetry where applicable. So we run the, uh, the CORMP funded spotter buoys in partition mode. Uh, I think this gives the best resolution for the surface conditions that are applicable to mariners. Uh, this is a little sketch of typically how we moor the buoys. Uh, we do use a short section of line 
um, suspending that surface buoy to keep the main portion of the mooring uh, underwater, reduce the chance of it entangling in a vessel. Uh, we've also used large spar marker buoys in some instances to increase visibility of the mooring to mariners. Uh, each mooring situation is a little different in regards to depth, currents, et cetera. And so we try to build each mooring in a way that maximizes the wave height before clipping while also reducing uh, self-entanglement. So this is a quick slide showing the passing of Tropical Storm Adalia off our coast and kind of through our uh, buoy network. Um, the buoy that's highlighted there is a wave buoy off of Fripp Island, South Carolina. Uh, it's more than about 40 feet of water. It's a pretty high current area, um, fair amount of recreational vessel traffic. Um, so this is our, our website. So we uh, run automated QAQC on all collected data parameters, uh, utilizing the NOAA Cortad standards. Um, I'm pretty fond of the visualization of our web page. Our web and database manager does a brilliant job. Um, you can view station data by hovering over it and then also selecting uh, the station site um, where you can view current or graph data. Uh, we've got radar, National Hurricane Center storm paths, tropical wind forecasts, satellite view, and NCEP wave forecast layers available. So back in 2020, we wrote our current grant proposal that we're operating off of right now. Uh, we wanted to expand and fill some observational gaps in the South Carolina area. So we partnered with the South Carolina Port Authority the Charleston Branch Pilots Association and developed a plan to establish a new site that would inform our their operations. Uh, we deployed the first Met Ocean buoy and smart mooring spotter buoy in the spring of 2022. And it was turned again in 2023, spring 2023. Uh, we received a lot of great feedback from the commercial shipping interests in Charleston, as well as the forecasting side from the National Weather Service and the recreational and charter fishing communities out there. Uh, it's been a pretty big success. It's you know always nice when uh, a community responds to getting a new um, observation site. Corp has been working with so far um, since about 2020, 2019 maybe. Um, we developed a pretty good working relationship with them and have been able to assist in their National Oceanographic Partnership Program sites in our area. Um, this year's site was about 20 nautical miles offshore of Long Bay. Uh, I think, unfortunately, it came unmoored uh, early last week. And I think it's the efforts are being made to recover that buoy. Um, Court greatly appreciates the goals of this partnership program as the data utilization stands to inform our communities and create greater storm resilience and save lives in our region. All right. So this uh, UNCW entered into a cooperative agreement with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in 2022 to ev evaluate frying pan shoals as a potential source to mitigate existing and future sand resource deficits. Uh, this pro project is utilizing spotter buoys to better understand the wave environment of frying pan shoals and how this affects sediment transport and other coupled processes. Um, Dr. Joe Long, who's the one of the lead PIs on this project, is who first turned us on to the spotter buoy back in 2020 when we helped him establish two nearshore sites off of Wrightsville Beach. Um, I think we've got we're going on almost four, three, I guess coming up on four years of data collected from those sites. Next week, we're going to be heading underway to Central Florida, deploying two new stations, one off of Ponce de Leon Inlet and the other off of Fort Pierce. Uh, both of these will be full NDVC uh, stations with uh, WMO IDs, and one will be utilizing a uh, spotter buoy at the, uh, the Ponce de Leon site. So we're looking forward to deploying those, and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, um, Omar, I will pass it off to you. Take it away. Thanks for having Hi, guys. So thank you so far for the opportunity. My name is Omar Shamir from uh, the National Authority of 
maritime affairs at the Dominican Republic. So my background basically have been working with uh, whales and tor sea turtles, but uh, recently I have switched department and I've been working in oceanographic issues. So it is my bad English because it's not my mother language. So the National Authority for Maritime Affairs is a government agency that have to deal with everything related to the sea and the ocean. Uh, conservation and protection for the non-living resources and the living resources and the marine policy, national or international. So we basically are created by law. So uh, this is our legal framework. So uh, we created in this agency was created in, in 2007. And then this is the organization chart. So our head, uh, we, we, our headquarters are in Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic. And uh, our main authority, it's uh, naming by presidential decree, which is very important. Our vision is, as agency, it's towards a maritime state and promote the blue economy. So we have a, a, a big commitment to promote everything that it's promoting uh, like a sustainable use for the for the sea, for for that make happen. So we need to assess and record data. And then uh, working on that matter, uh, our agency have been doing synergy with the national and international agencies such as NOAA. We have a couple of agreement working with NOAA. Regarding uh, with the spotter, we get the spotter like two years ago, I think, and then we have to go through to all the paperwork. So to develop the first oceanographic network in the Dominican Republic. So this network is combined using sported smart buoy and tie gauges. So we have been uh, deployment uh, this device all the way to the Dominican coast and so far, we have uh, at least 10 devices. We also use uh, now for the Caribbean region, the sargasso influence is a big issue. And also the, the, the buoys allow us to generate our own model for core, our own model for forecast uh, when uh, the big mass of sargasso is approaching to the coast. So, so far we have uh, 10 buoys uh, deployment around the coast. It's an open access platform for everybody. And then we have been deployment side by side with the local community. So we believe in the cost of development, but also side by side by the local community. For each deployment, we have to socialize in advance with the stakeholder, with the local stakeholder. So we have been working with the diving school, uh, ports authority, uh, fishermen communities, uh, local university, I mean, everything. So we develop our own dashboard in it's, it's available in the, our webpage for everything. I mean, so we, we basically gave them to the general public data set, wind direction, wind speed, way high and uh, direction, and also with the tide. So all the information is uh, available for the public for free in our webpage. So the application that we so far have been applying is for the port activity, the academia, so researchers, sport and recreational fishing, researchers uh, for natural disasters such as uh, the storm. We have uh, one uh, passed by like two weeks ago. And then the spotter give you precisely information about the high, about the high of the wave. And also coastal engineering. 
So this is also in on screen. You have uh, also when we went deploying the tie gauges and to record uh, the tidal oscillation and sea level rise. Is the first. I mean, this is the first network available in the, the in the Dominican Republic. So we have been able to be record for more than a year all the temperature sea, sea surface temperature around the coast. So this is a huge data because also we have the commitment with the SDG goal with the so we have to submit that data and process that data. Why so far why we recommend so far? I mean from our point of view, uh, the budget is really, I mean, for a country like the Dominican Republic, budget is, is a big thing. So uh, we need to find some, some device that are more to our reality. So it's a user-friendly, the platform is a very user-friendly, it's very easy to deploy. So we don't need like a heavy equipment or crane to deploy. The resistant material, so far we have for over, more over than a year, we won with our first device deployment, and then it stayed like at the same day. And then I think the first, I mean, the most important thing for us is the customer service after serve, after sale. So everything that we have any facing an issue uh, with the, a platform with the device, we receive a quick, quick response. So, which is quite good for us because we are beginner in that matter. So this is everything that I have to share. Basically uh, we have for this year, we are aiming to deploy tier three more device. And then we are aiming for next year to deploy two more device in, in the banks. We have two banks offshore that are economical and ecological important for the Dominican Republic. And we we are aiming for uh, 2024 to deploy at least one device in the banks. So basically taken for sharing, we are open to questions and to do synergy and collaboration. And uh, please follow us in, in our social network. Thanks so much, Omar. Um, all right. Well, that wraps up our presentations. It was really interesting to hear from all of you directly. Um, Omar, since you just finished, I'll start with you first. Um, I'm curious, how how do you select um, you know, the sites? I'm sure that there are a lot of different areas of potential interest for you know economical zones or activities, maritime recreation. Um, but how do you narrow it down to the, you know, nine to let's say 15 specific areas where you, you need data um, most? Uh, basically, uh, in the first place, we need to, to make sure that the device is gonna be safe. So we need to identify one local stakeholder that can then, and after that, we select like a, a interesting area that could be coral reef that's depend the area because we have a mix so we could could be coral reef nursery nearby could be poor uh, poor activity nearby and then could be like a sensitive area like a marine protected area so those are the features we we look at it but the first one to be honest is the safety of the device because uh, could be stolen or could be, I mean, the, the community don't be agreed. So we make sure that uh, to combine all those features to deployment. Got it. Thanks, Omar. And it looks like Elizabeth has a question for you as well. Um, she asked, how did you build the data view for the public? Yeah, so we, we build like a dashboard. It's available on our website. Uh, we're still working on it. So we all the data, live data, we connect connected through the so far API, and then do use using the click, uh, the general public can have access to to that data. So we, as a government agency, 
we need to put uh, all of the information to the to the public. Thanks, Omar. And yeah, Elizabeth, just to clarify too, um, there's an API that you get access to with each spotter buoy, and you can forward the data from that API into you know a web page that you're building up. Um, so it makes it pretty easy to build out your own dashboard views. Scott, I just saw your question as well. How easy are batteries in the spotters to change out? Um, the spotter actually doesn't require a battery swap. It's completely powered by the sun. It's an onboard lithium ion rechar rechargeable battery. Um, so there's never any swapping that happens. Um, Rena, I see you have your hand up. I'll unmute you now. Sorry, that was accidental. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, okay, great. I don't see any other questions, but I do have one um, for you, Katie, and one for you, Chris. I think sort of both along the same lines. I'm curious, from your perspectives and experience using spotters and smart moorings, um, what are each of your respective sort of ideal visions for how you want to continue to build out your network of spotters or smart moorings, um, you know, from like a maintenance standpoint over time and also just at overall data collection? Do you want different types of sensors? Do you want more individual nodes? Both would love to hear from both of you on that topic. Sure, do you wanna go first, Katie? Yeah, sure, go ahead, Chris. Okay, um, let's see. I mean, Corp has really enjoyed, um, again, like Omar stated the affordability of being able to uh, broadly disseminate wave buoys in our region. Um, I think we'll probably continue with that goal. Um, Basically, so that we end up with, you know, any, anywhere that there's a, a site where we have a meteorological buoy, we'll have a wave buoy as well. Um, we have quite a few researchers working kind of in the coastal environment, so we'll probably continue to um, place bu buoys kind of in the, the 10 meter isobath location. Uh, we've got some new researchers that are a little more interested in storms and stuff offshore, so hopefully... It'd be kind of cool to get some uh, moored in maybe uh, about 10 miles east of the Gulf Stream kind of off of our location. I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, as far as sensor integration with the smart buoy, um, smart mooring system, we had one at the Charleston 60 site and it got destroyed by a vessel uh, collision. Um, I think the Port Authority really enjoyed that real-time water level data, so we will probably um, replace that in the future. Um, but yeah, that's I don't know, that's kind of where we are. But it's been it's been a really good experience. I've deployed I think eight of these buoys up in the Aleutians um, for another project with a faculty member here. Um, they lasted I think we're on our second year or third year for some of them. Um, so pretty robust as long as you can keep them from getting hit by ships. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah. yeah, super interesting. And I guess a tack on following question for you there too, that some people might be interested in. You have a lot of experience deploying systems offshore. Like what what is the comparable, I guess, experience to deploying a spotter, you know, to a traditional way of buoy? A buoy? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the spotter buoy, I mean, it's, you know, cost-wise, again, you know, much less cost for a mooring. I mean, the last time I got a data well, you know, full quote on a mooring system, I mean, it's a couple thousand dollars just for the mooring. And we all know the cost of the buoys is, uh, you know, 10 times that of a spotter buoy. Um, super simple operation as far as like, you know, putting together the mooring, you know, as long as you've got someone in your faculty or, or staff or whatever that can splice and choose some good materials, some good stainless swivels and thimbles and everything. Um, you can make a pretty easy or a pretty good mooring for, you know, a hundred dollars maybe um, in supplies, which can be deployed off of a, a small boat, depending on the, you know, location of the vest of the site. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Sure. Um, and then Katie, I'm curious to hear from you as well on, you know, your, grand vision for um, your monitoring network? 
Yeah, so we actually took delivery on this first set of buoys uh, just about a month ago, and we are waiting for final permitting to actually install these. But um, we have such confidence in them that we're already putting together uh, paperwork needed to uh, purchase additional sets to deploy uh, at sites that some of our partners have determined would be important for having temperature data. So those will actually be sites where our partners um, are growing coral in these protected offshore, what we call nurseries, and having a record of temperature there is also very important. Uh, we currently have one of those bristle mouth development kits, um, so definitely want to uh, when we have time, figure out how to integrate a turbidity sensor at least. And if we have a good experience with that, um, I can imagine that we will extend that to all of the other sites that we work at as well. Awesome. Cool. Well, I don't see any other questions coming through the chat window, so I think we can wrap up a couple minutes early. Um, the recording will be made available to everyone who participated. Um, thank you all so much for joining and especially to you, Chris, Katie, and Omar for participating on the panel as well. Really interesting presentations and excited to see where you take all these projects. So um, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and we will talk soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks.